Awaken, child of fate. Awaken, if free. The logo art for Final Fantasy typically represents the theme of the story or captures a significant moment or turning point in a single emblem. For Seven, the logo depicted the meteor that threatened the world's destruction, Eight focused on the romance plot, and Nine portrayed the final moments of the game. For Sixteen, the logo features Ifrit and Phoenix seemingly in conflict with one another, but paying attention to the logo in its animated form reveals that there is more to it. Each time the art burns onto the screen, it shows Ifrit and Phoenix pulling apart from one another. First, this hints at Clive's quest, at least for the onset of the game. He is estranged from Joshua and attempting to reunite with him. Second, this signifies that Ifrit and Phoenix are being pulled apart literally. They are born from a single icon and have been sundered. A pivotal moment in the game will involve reuniting them into their true form. The ultra expensive collector's edition has unique artwork for the box the statue comes in, an unidentified being amidst all of the other icons, most importantly, Phoenix and E3 to either side of it. This is chaos. Whilst we already have seen Phoenix battling E3, the story will twist and have E3 fighting Phoenix. This is where the rejoining will occur. I will delve further into this prediction in the later section. Chaos will be a New Game Plus skill tree. This mural notably has Ifrit and Phoenix missing. The pair are instead here, the icon, Chaos. This mural gives the impression that this icon is governing over all of the others, or perhaps fighting all of the others, but I'll return to this for a later prediction. There is an additional icon present on the mural that hasn't been shown anywhere else so far. Whereas Leviathan is missing from the Collector's Edition pin set, it is featured prominently on the mural with the other icons. The Iron Kingdom executes any dominant born on the islands, which means the Iron Kingdom has slain the dominant of Leviathan. There is no fixed period of time for a new dominant awakening. After a dominant of an icon dies, it can take five minutes or five decades. Part of the journey across the Iron Islands will see Clive learning or potentially witnessing the execution of a new dominant of Leviathan. The time skips in the story will allow for the dominant to arise once more, later in Clive's tale. The first crystal Clive destroys is Drake's Breath, the one shared by his homeland of Rosaria and the Iron Kingdom. This will have a ripple effect of loosening the Iron Kingdom's iron-fisted rule over the Iron Islands, allowing a dominant of Leviathan to either awaken away from the islands or be able to escape them. A major theme of Final Fantasy is balance, especially true with the elements. Light is opposed with darkness, wind opposed with earth, lightning opposed with ice, and finally, Fire is opposed with water. With the Iron Kingdom relentlessly slaying the dominant of water that arises each time, it has provoked an imbalance which has allowed for the seemingly impossible event of two icons of fire appearing. Leviathan will also be a new game plus skill tree. One last thing before the next prediction, the proximity of Valisteia to Leviathan is far too close to ignore. Every character that has an icon to their name has been referred to as a dominant, with one notable exception, Clive. On the official website, there are character profiles. Each profile comes with artwork of their human form and their accompanying icon. Everyone, except for Clive. Torgol lacks an icon as well, but I'll talk about this in the next prediction. Clive isn't actually a dominant, in spite of his appearance of being one owing to his access to Ifrit. Joshua granted Clive a blessing, and this enables Clive to channel a part of Phoenix's power. Ifrit is the same, but instead of having the ability to channel, the blessing of Ifrit has instead given him the ability to become Ifrit. Next, referring to the ESRB rating summary, to talk on Clive's identity. Principally, the first sentence. This is an action role-playing game in which players assume the role of an enslaved prince, Clive, on a quest to find his missing brother. Clive's father is an Archduke, his mother an Archduchess. Children of these rank of individuals wouldn't be referred to as a prince or princess, as that title would be of higher nobility than an Archduke and Archduchess. Clive is not the true-born son of Elwyn and Annabella. At a maximum, he will be the son of Elwyn. The important part of Clive's identity is that he will be a direct descendant of the fallen civilization, as in, one stage removed, not like how the population of Valisteia are all technically descendants of the fallen civilization. 
Elwyn is killed in the beginning stages of the game as we've seen in the trailers, and with him the secret of Clive's lineage dies as well, at least until Clive discovers this mural, where another will identify him specifically. The second half of the sentence I'll save for my prediction on Joshua, Clive will survive the end credits. Torgol will have a playable section. In his time apart from Clive, Torgol has found a bracelet to equip himself with. This bracelet will be an artifact that is curbing his true power. Torgol hails from the northern territories the same as Jill, and this area of Valistea will be steeped in tales of great power. One of which will be Torgol being an icon himself. Fenrir will be his form, and it will be ice aspected just the same as Jill, and just as he was in 14. I have more for Torgol, specifically within my Jill and Barnabas predictions. Torgol will survive the end credits. Jill will have a playable section. Clive will begin the game estranged from Jill and not realise that she is Shiva. The realisation will knock Clive off the path of revenge that he is treading and shift his focus to the Mother Crystals instead. He will realise that the icons and dominance are not bad by default owing to his relationship with her and the goal instead will shift to freeing Valistea of the Icon Curse via the destruction of the crystals. In 13, Shiva was comprised of two twins as her standard form before evolving into the complete Eidolon as her Gestalt. Jill and Torgol will have a similar relationship, and the pair together will reach new heights of power. Clive and Jill will not be directly romantically involved, there will be tension, but ultimately nothing will occur between the two. Jill will survive the end credits. Squeal, piggy, squeal. <laughs> Sid will have a playable section. Sid will petrify in defense of the hideaway after it comes under attack from parties that wish to destroy Clive. Sid, controlled by the player, will summon an ungodly attack that drains the remainder of his ether, rendering him finally as stone. This will also erect a barrier around the hideaway, protecting it from further attack. After petrifying, Sid will be placed as a statue at the center of the hideaway. As Sid is petrified rather than killed, his blessing of Ramu powers will stay active for Clive. This eventuality will cause Clive to question whether Joshua is actually truly still alive, as the blessing of the Phoenix still being active was the cornerstone of his hope for such. This event of a dominant petrifying and the blessing remaining active will foreshadow the end of the game. Sid, obviously then, will not survive the end credits. Benedicta will be the individual with no fixed allegiances. She will be self-serving and have moods change with the winds. Can you stop staring at my tit, please? But ultimately, she will be acting on orders directly from the hooded figure. Benedicta will be romantically involved with Sid, Barnabas, Hugo, and a fourth, unseen character. Benedicta will not survive the end credits, but she will not be killed fully and finally at the point we have seen in 16's previews. The only thing I really have for Hugo is that his surname is somewhat comical, meaning small or droplet in English. Hugo will also not survive the end credits. Barnabas will have a playable section. This man here is Sleipner. Barnabas is Odin only, and has a designate to be Sleipner, as a variation of the blessing that Joshua can give for Phoenix. The blessing that Barnabas gives is to have someone be his steed. Learning this in the story is the foreshadowing that Torgol will have a hidden form as well. This will come to fruition when Torgol transforms and joins with Jill. Barnabas will not survive the end credits. He will sacrifice himself to destroy Drake's spine. The crystal is situated in his homeland, Walud. Honestly, it's a complete travesty that the dominant of Odin is a named Dion, but I digress. Dion will have a playable section. Dion is the character that is never truly on one side. Being the embodiment of light doesn't mean he is altruistically good, but he will always act in accordance with his own moral compass. Dion will end up related to Clive in some way, I'm going to say cousin, on his secret mother's side. This isn't because they look alike or anything like that, but rather owing to Dion being the dominant of Bahamut. I'll go into more detail in my prediction for the final boss. Dion will survive the end credits. Joshua is the only trueborn son of Elwyn and Annabella. Joshua isn't dead. This is where the second sentence of the ESRB rating comes in to confirm. In 14, the primal phoenix makes an appearance as well, but does so whilst under the thrall of a familiar primal. Joshua's path in 16 will echo this. 
Joshua will survive the end credits, in a sense. Full detail of this will come in a later prediction. The figure being hooded means the audience and other characters will know who it is right now. The reveal of his identity will show his face to be a fully grown Joshua, but this will be a red herring. A similar twist occurred in 14, with a character being seemingly revealed as a traitor, but was in actuality under the influence of a higher power. So too will the story be here. Phoenix's ability allows for respawn, but comes with the price of corrupting the dominant. There is one true Phoenix, and dominants of this icon end up as vessels for someone of the fallen civilization. Joshua is particularly susceptible owing to his sickly nature. Joshua will be freed of the malevolent force when Ifrit and Phoenix combine. The fallen civilization rode a giant creature across the sky. The cities and ruins across Valastea were originally built upon this creature's back. In their striving for perfection, they drained the creature's ether, exhausting it and causing it to fall from the sky. Few people of the fallen civilization survived, most remaining in stasis. The hooded figure is of the fallen civilization, but it is their consciousness that is possessing Joshua, rather than them physically walking the land. Each icon will have a surviving fallen civilization counterpart, sleeping in stasis. The dominants chosen are done so directly by these sleeping individuals. I'll talk more on the giant creature in a later prediction. All of the crystals are part of a greater whole, which factor into whom the final boss will be. The crystals collectively form a seal on the final boss. Destroying the crystals removes the seal. There is a Chinese myth about a five-clawed golden dragon. There are five mother crystals. All life is said to come from the dragon, as all icons come from the mother crystals. I'll go into this in more detail in the final prediction. There are two levels of manipulation that Clive will be prey to. One, to destroy each of the crystals. He will believe this will free the people of Alastair, but it is actually the path to his doom. Second, to have all icons channeled into one body, his. When the two are combined, the great summoning will occur. The blight befalling Valisteia is the magic receding back to the crystals, as the great beast the fallen civilization rode upon is regaining consciousness. More on this in the final prediction. Cly's final iconic form will be chaos, when he and Joshua are reunited and become one. This is why Joshua survives in a roundabout way. He will survive as a part of Clive. I think the game's box art is secretly hinting at this fact, that Joshua is a part of Clive. As the actual final boss, Clive will have to defeat each of the icons in turn. They will have dark manifestations, similar to the dark icon of power. One way or another, the player will be able to control each of the icons in the final fight, including a surprise in the form of Leviathan. This is the main reason I believe multiple characters and icons to be playable throughout the story to train the player in preparation for the final assault. Otherwise, the final battle would be ruined by the need to provide tutorials to the player. Rosaria and the Iron Kingdom share Drake's breath. Sambrek has Drake's head. Walud has Drake's spine. Dalmec has Drake's fang. And finally, the Crystalline Dominion holds Drake's tail. All of the crystals sharing a naming convention hints that they are all linked. Shinryu will be the final boss. The destruction of all of the crystals will bring about its summoning. This mural depicts all of the icons of Chaos at the top. This gives the impression that all icons will have to team up against Chaos. Further clued in by the fact that they all have halos, with the exception of Chaos. The mural is incomplete however, with the edges eroded away. What was once there was Shinryu, encircling them all. All icons are born from Shinryu. The final boss will be multi-stage, Clive fighting with the combined might of all of the icons against the hooded figure in Shinryu. The fight will stretch across human forms, half iconic forms, and the ultimate fight against Shinryu awakened. Shinryu will not die, but be petrified. This will ensure that Valastea still retains access to his magic, as foreshadowed by Sid's blessing remaining active when he was petrified. The overall Metacritic score for the game will land on 88, because 8 plus 8 is 16. The lowest critic score will be 60 and the highest will be 95. IGN will give the game a score between 8.9 and 9.1. At least one reviewer will name their review Final Fantasy Sweet 16 with the tagline, Final Fantasy Comes of Age. If no one does, I'll use it for my video review. I'll make my own dreams come true.
Within the reviews, the main positives that will be remarked upon will be how the franchise has evolved, and that is picked up a mature direction for the series. The main negatives that will be remarked upon will be how the combat can be drowned out by the visual effects, the combat can become repetitive, and the story causes them to grow impatient for their next combat sequence. That's it. Those are all of my predictions. Technically, I've given more than 16, but 50 predictions for Final Fantasy 16 didn't quite have the same ring to it. There are 16 sections at least. This bonus section doesn't count. It's a freebie. If you've watched this before the game releases, the wait is almost over. If you're watching this after everything is known, please have a little mercy on me if everything I've said turns out to be utter nonsense. I'll see you on the other side, Dominance. Squeal, piggy, squeal. Squeal, piggy, squeal.